Good evening, Mr. Evans here, and we have a new book tonight. This one is called The Sugar Creek Gang by Paul Hutchins, and it was published first in 1949, so when my dad was 10 years old. It's been a few years ago now. It was the laziest day I ever saw, and so hot it would have made any boy want to go fishing or swimming or maybe both. I don't think I was ever so glad in my life that school was out, because just as soon as I saw those big fat fishing worms being turned up by Pop's plow when he was breaking the garden, I knew what I wanted to do, what I had to do, in fact, or the whole, whole day would be spoiled. Right away I laid my rake down, for I was raking the yard, and went out behind our garage to where there was a whole barrel full of empty tin cans, which, pretty soon, in a week maybe, we'd have to haul away to the dump down along Sugar Creek. I picked out the best bait can I could find, threw in a handful of dirt, and started dropping in the biggest, juiciest fishing worms you ever saw. The kind that would make any fish go so crazy with hunger, he'd risk getting caught rather than let the worm wriggle around on the hook all by itself. Like that time I sneaked into Mom's pantry, and filled my pockets full of cookies, and had my mouth full, too, just as Mom came hurrying down from upstairs where she'd been making the beds. Mom took one look at me and called out sharply, William Jasper Collins, and made a dive for me. She caught me, too, and... But that's a story I don't tell anybody about. Only after the licking quit hurting, I made up my mind I'd never take any more cookies without asking first. I've got the best mom in the world. Don't think I haven't. I was just a little boy then and didn't know any better. But I guess that licking hurt worse, hurt mom worse than it did me. Because long after I'd quit crying, I saw her eyes were kind of red like around the lids. And that night when I'd said my prayers and been tucked into bed, she hugged me awful tight. But as I said, that was when I was a little boy, not more than seven years old. Now I say my prayers all by myself and climb into the bed in the dark and just call goodnight down the stairs. I wouldn't let Mom know for the world that I kind of miss being tucked in, but I do just the same. Well, pretty soon I had that bait can almost full of worms and was thinking how hot it was here in the garden and how cool it would be down at the mouth of the branch and how Roy Gilbert and I would just lie there in the new green grass and watch the lazy specks of foam floating along on the river. And every now and then our bobbers would start acting funny, moving around in circles and ducking under the water like tiny diving birds, and our string of fish would get longer and longer, with sunfish and rock bass and chubs and... Jasper! Pop's big voice was just like a finger being poked into a great big beautiful soap bubble. It burst my little dream all to nothing. And when Pop called me Jasper instead of Bill, I knew he didn't like what I was doing. I set the bait can down in the deep furrow and called back innocently, What? What are you up to? Pop demanded. He had the horse's reins slipped around his shoulders, and his hands were gripping the plow handles awful tight. I could tell, because his sleeves were rolled up, and the muscles, arms, the muscles on his arms were like great big ropes. My pop was awful strong, or maybe I should say very strong. My folks were having a hard time teaching me to use the right words. It's awful hard to quit using the wrong ones, you know. I didn't know what to say to my pop, so I just called back indifferently, nothing, and picked up a clot of dirt and threw it at a blackbird that was gobbling up all the worms which I had missed. Come here, Pop said roughly, and bring that can of worms with you. My heart went flop. You couldn't fool Pop in anything, and I knew better than to try, but I could just see the whole day being spoiled. Just think of all those fish swimming around down on the bottom of the creek, hungry for nice wriggling worms, and yes, just think of how Pop liked, eat, liked to eat fish when they were all cleaned and rolled in cornmeal and fried crisp and brown in the way Mom can fry them. 
I decided to remind Pop how good they'd taste for supper that night while I picked up that can of worms and walked across the garden to where he was waiting for me. He could always read my mind, just like I could read a book. I was in the fifth grade in school, you know. Pop's big blackish-red eyebrows were down. He had turned around and was sitting on the cross piece between the plow handles, and I was just standing there holding the can of worms in both hands. The horses were so hot there was white lather all over them. They'd be, been sweating so much. That is, there was lather where the harness rubbed their sides, and you could smell the sweat. Sweat was trickling down Pop's face, too. I guess there never was a hotter day in the spring, with little heat waves dancing all over the garden. I kept looking down at my toes, which were digging themselves into the cool, new-turned earth, and Pop kept glaring at my can of worms. I hadn't really done anything wrong, hadn't exactly planned anything wrong or even thought it, except maybe wishing I didn't have to rake the yard, and hating rakes and hoes and garden making and all, all work. I guess you'd call it being lazy, and maybe it was. Well, Pop demanded, and then I saw his snow-white teeth gleaming under his red-brown mustache and a twinkle in his eye, and it was like a cool dive into Sugar Creek on a smothering hot day. Whenever I saw Pop's teeth shining under his mustache, I knew everything was all right. Bill Collins, he said, and I felt better than ever even though his voice was still gruff. I want you to take that garden rake and clean it off and put it away in the tool house. Then get your long cane fishing pole and go down to the mouth of the branch. You and Roy Gilbert are some of the boys, and fish and fish and wait in the, bran in the branch until you get over that terrible case of spring fever. And don't come back until you've caught all the fish that'll bite. You've had a hard school year with your arith arithmetic and geography and science, and you need a rest. At first, I couldn't believe he meant it, but when he reached out and kind of put his arm around my shoulder and gave me half a hug and said, I was once a boy, too. I believed him without trying. You should have seen me carrying that long cane fishing pole in one hand and the can of worms in the other running straight towards the mouth of the branch where I knew Roy would be waiting for me, for last night we'd laid our plans to meet there today at two o'clock, if we could. But I never dreamed so many things could happen all in one day, nor that before I'd get back home again Roy and I would have been scared almost to death, nor that it was going to be the beginning of the most exciting week of my whole life. Chapter 2 It happened this way. Roy and I were lying there in the grass on the bank of the creek, just like I told you we would, with our fishing poles reaching far out over the waters, and with funny-looking, enormous-eyed, four-winged dragonflies nosing around our lines, like little hummingbirds around Mom's morning glories back home, when all of a sudden my bobber, which was nothing more than a big cork out of Mom's vinegar jug, started acting like it was alive. It moved around in a funny little half circle, kind of slow like at first, and then plunk, just like that it ducked under, making a big splash. And the end of my pole bent clear down and struck the water with a smack. I knew before I could think that I'd hooked a big fish. I grabbed, the end of, I grabbed my end of the pole quicker than anything and held on tight. Roy told me afterwards that my eyes stuck out like a dragonfly's when I was pulling that fish in. And my line didn't break either, because I had a brand new one. That's another reason why I knew my pop liked me, maybe better than any pop ever liked his boy before. Because when I'd gone to get my fishing pole out of the tool shed an hour before, it had had a brand new line on it, with a reel and everything. Pop acted surprised when he saw it, but there was a twinkle in his gray eyes and I knew he'd bought it for me. Maybe you think I wasn't scared, though, when my bare feet slipped on the edge of the bank and flew right out from under me, and I went down kersplash into the water, still holding on to that fishing pole for dear life. Roy was standing on the shore, jumping up and down and yelling at the top of his lungs and screaming at me what to do and not to let go of the pole. 
I saw him, he cried. He was a big black bass, two feet long. I could barely touch the bottom of the creek with my feet. While I was feeling the heavy pulling and jerking of that big fish on the end of the line, and thinking about my new overalls being all wet, and mom, what mom would say to me when I got home, because she told me to be specially careful not to get them all wet and dirty. Roy got hold of one of my hands and started to pull me out. Give me the pole, quick, he screamed. And then, just like it had happened to me, it happened to him too. His feet slipped, and there we were, both of us in the water. Of course, we could both swim, so there wasn't any danger of drowning. You know, everybody ought to learn how to swim when he's little, because you can never tell when he'll either have to swim or drown. Well, between the two of us, we landed the fish, and it was a big black bass all right, only it was about 14 inches long, or maybe 12, instead of two feet like Roy had said. And that's how he came to get the dr nickname Dragonfly, because his eyes were bigger than his head. Anyway, he was always seeing things twice as big as they were. He kind of liked the name, and so did I, feeling quite proud to think I'd thought of it first. I tell you, that water felt good. Now that we're all wet, we'd just as well go and swim, and Dragonfly said. Besides, we'll have to let our clothes dry, won't we? And they'll dry quicker than anything hanging out on those bushes while we swim. Pop hadn't told me I couldn't go swimming figuring maybe I'd like to, and not wanting me to be tempted to disobey him and then have to have a licking. Dragonfly's parents hadn't told him not to either, so in about a minute and a half we had that 12-inch bass, oh, well, maybe he was only about 11 inches long, fastened on a stringer and swimming around in his jail over in the branch, which empties into the creek right near where we'd been fishing. Our clothes were hanging on some bushes, drying, and we were out there in that fine, clean water, splashing and swimming and diving and having the time of our lives. Understand, we were waiting for our clothes to dry. We weren't just swimming for the fun of it, of course. We stayed in maybe half an hour, having a grand old time and wishing all the gang was there. Let me tell you about our gang, the finest bunch of boys you ever heard of. I reckon there will never be a gang of boys in the whole world that'll have any more fun than we did. There was little Jimmy Foote, who was the littlest one of us and who always obeyed his parents and was a sort of mascot for us because he was so good. Anyway, he seemed to bring us good luck whenever he was along. We didn't care if he was about the only one of us that was religious because he was so likable. And he wasn't any sissy either. Say, that little fellow was brave. Once when there was a bear after us, and little Jim was carrying Big Jim's rifle. But that's another part of my story, which I can't tell you till a little later. Well, there was little Jim and poetry and... But let me tell you about Leslie Thompson. We called him poetry because he was always quoting a verse or two of poetry. Everything he saw would start him off, and sometimes we'd have to shut him up, or the rest of us wouldn't get a chance to say a word. He was fatter than anything, almost as broad as he was tall, and his voice was changing so that it sounded awful squawky. He used to sing soprano in the junior choir in our church, but now he wouldn't sing at all, and folks just don't seem to understand that when a boy's voice gets all squawky like a duck with a bad cold, he's terrible bashful about singing or talking in public. It didn't mean that poetry was any less interested in church at all, because I once stayed all night at his house, and we slept, and before we went to bed, he got right down on his knees and prayed first, and when he got through saying his little poem prayer, which he'd learned when he was little, he added a lot of words of his own, just like he was talking to somebody right in the room. And I guess maybe he was. It kind of scared me at first, but I didn't let him see a stubborn old tear that got in my eyes about that time. Anyway, that's how I learned to add things to my prayer, too. Well, poetry was always ask, acting mysterious, and was going to be a detective someday, he said. And he was always getting into mischief. And then there was Circus Brown, whose real name was Daniel August Brown. Whatever his parents wanted to give him such a long-legged name for, I don't know. We called him Circus because he was so acrobatic. He could turn handsprings, 
walk on his hands, turn the pinwheel, and he could shin up a tree quicker than anybody I ever saw. Besides Dragonfly and Poetry and Little Jim and Circus and me, there was Big Jim. We called him Big Jim because he, he and Little Jim had the same names, and we didn't want to get him mixed up. Big Jim was the leader of the gang, and he knew all the things a leader ought to know. He'd belonged to a Boy Scout patrol once before he'd moved into our neighborhood, and was what they call a first-class scout. First he'd been a tenderfoot, then a second class, then a first class. He could have gone on to qualify for star or life or eagle rank, but his folks had had to move, and there wasn't any scout troop where we lived. Besides, you have to be 12 years old to be even a tenderfoot, so that would have meant that Dragonfly and Poetry and Little Jim and I would have been left out. So Big Jim just called us the gang. Say, Big Jim was strong. Almost as strong as my pop, I reckon, and he used almost perfect English. He knew exactly what to do in case anybody fainted. He could make a tourniquet for stopping the flow of blood when anybody was bleeding terribly. He could tie 21 different kinds of knots, such as the Magnus hitch, the fisherman's bend, the half hitch, and the bowline knot. He was the catcher of our ball team and could knock more home runs than any of us. He could jump the farthest and was the best fighter I ever saw, only we didn't get into many fights on account of Big Jim. Kept other boys in the neighborhood from starting anything, they being scared of him. Poetry could quote more poetry than any of the rest of us. Circus could climb a tree the fastest and do more acrobatic stunts, and Dragonfly was able to see bigger things and see the farthest. And Little Jim was more of a Christian than the whole lot of us put together. As for me, I guess I was just an ordinary boy. I didn't even have a nickname except just plain Bill, which is short for William. As I said, Dragonfly and I must have stayed in the water about a half hour. Anyway, when you can't, haven't been in swimming for a long time, and it's such a terribly hot day, time goes pretty fast, and you forget about everything else, except how much fun you're having. It was Dragonfly who saw it first. Saw him, rather. All of a sudden, Dragonfly stopped splashing and yelling, and hissed to me, Quick, Bill, get down under the water. Somebody's coming. We both dropped down so only our chins and noses were sticking out, looking maybe like a couple of turtles with only their, no only their noses showing above the water. Look, Dragonfly whispered, it's an old man with long white whiskers, and he's coming right straight this way. I don't see anything, I said, and then I saw him. A short, fat man about as big around as a barrel, bareheaded with long, shaggy white hair with whiskers, that reached clear down to his belt, only he didn't have any belt on, on account of he was wearing a pair of old overalls. He had on dark glasses, and he shuffled along like he couldn't see very well. He looked just like an old tramp. Itinerants, Pop, Pop called them, which didn't sound so bad. But I guess there never was a boy that wasn't a little bit scared of one of them, especially one that looked as fierce as that one did. Chapter 3 We kept as quiet as we could, hoping the old man wouldn't see us and would go right on past. We didn't want him to take our fishing poles or our big bass or... Look! Dragonfly pinched me so hard under the water that I nearly yelled. But the fact is, I was so scared I couldn't have yelled very loud, for I'd never seen such a fierce-looking man in all my life. He spied our clothes, Dragonfly said, and sure enough he had, and was pushing his way through the tall weeds right straight toward them. We knew right then we'd better do something quick, for I had a brand new knife in my overall pocket, and Dragonfly had a watch in his. Let's scream like a hundred wild Indians, Dragonfly said, his teeth chattering. It sounded like a good idea, so we both let out a yell as loud as we could making it sound as fierce as if we were a whole tri of, tribe of Indians. Only I knew it must have sounded like two kids half scared to death, which it did. But the old man acted like he was deaf or something, for he didn't even look around. 
He was standing right near where our clothes were hanging, and in a second he was going through our pockets. He found Dragonfly's watch first and held it up in the sunlight close to his big dark glasses, brushed it against his long white whiskers like he was brushing dust off of it, put it to his ear and listened, then shook his head as if he couldn't hear a thing. My, my watch, Dragonfly whispered and gulped. I'd never seen him so scared before. And being scared is kind of like getting the measles. It's catching. Dragonfly's face made me afraid, too. But if getting scared is contagious, so is getting angry. Pretty soon, we were both so mad, we knew we were going to do something fierce in just about a minute. We yelled again, a wild, blood-curdling scream. But do you think that made any difference? Not a bit. He's deaf, Dragonfly said, and I believed it. And when I saw my new knife going down in that old man's pocket, I began to get madder than ever. Then that old man just naturally picked up our clothes, slung them over his shoulder, and waddled back through the tall grass and weeds, whistling. Whistling, mind you. We knew we couldn't go home without our clothes, only at that time I didn't know much of anything I was so mad. And so was Dragonfly. We knew we would have to do something, and you can bet your life we did. We climbed up that creek bank, picked up a whole couple of clubs, and whooped it up like a whole tribe of Indians, swinging our clubs and yelling, Come back here with our clothes. Stop or we'll shoot, and just about everything else frightening we could think of. But that big round barrel of a man with his long white hair shining in the sunlight just turned around and glared at us. He seemed to know the lay of the land there, too, for he shuffled quickly to the right and tossed our clothes right over into the middle of a briar patch and said gruffly, Help yourself. A briar patch, mind you, and both of us barefoot and stark naked. Why, we'd be scratched half to death trying to get those clothes. That was too much. We both made a dive for him, and before you could say Jack Robinson, we'd caught up with him. Not because we could run the fastest, for he was faster than a deer, but because he stumbled and fell and rolled down the hill, and we stumbled after him, landing right on top of him and getting our arms and legs all tangled up like an octopus, doing an acrobatic stunt. Stop, he cried. Don't hurt me. I'll give up. And then, as if he was crazy, he started qu quoting, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. In a jiffy, those long whiskers were off, and the long hair and the dark glasses, and we were looking straight into the mischievous little blue eyes of Leslie Poetry Thompson, who started to laugh and laugh as loud as he could, and quoted from the night before Christmas. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. Poetry sprang to his feet and began to dance a jig and to sing, Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. He held up Dragonfly's watch and my knife and started all over again about the cat and the fiddle. Well, I was so mad, still mad, and so was Dragonfly. And as much as we like good old mischievous poetry... We made him wade out into that briar patch and get our clothes, which were still a little wet. And then we all went in swimming, where Poetry got ducked again and again for being so smart. Only it was just like trying to duck a rubber barrel. He, he wouldn't stay under, and he could swim and dive like a fish. Where'd you get your whiskers, I asked, when we were dressing. And your dark glasses and your long hair, Dragonfly wanted to know. Wouldn't you like to know? Poetry asked. Then he lowered his voice and looked around mysteriously. I found him, he said. Found him? Dragonfly and I asked in chorus. In the old hollow sycamore tree down along the swamp. How do you suppose they got there? I asked. Poetry looked at me scornfully as if I was too ignorant to know much about mysterious things. They grew there just like moss, he said. 
Maybe there's some robber or something around here, Dragonfly said, trying on the dark glasses. Poetry looked pretty serious when Dragonfly said that, and that too was like getting the measles. The more we thought about it, the more we began to wonder if Dragonfly might not be right. That old sycamore tree was the biggest tree around here anywhere, the biggest around anyway. And about three or four feet from the ground was a big opening, and inside it was all hollow, large enough for three of us boys to stand in it at the same time. That is, three the size of Little Jim and Dragonfly and me. Poetry just about filled it himself. In fact, he was so fat this year that he couldn't even get inside the opening. The tree grew about 15 feet from a steep precipice that dropped straight down a rocky bank into Sugar Creek. It was an awful lonely place down in that part of the woods, and none of us boys ever went there alone because our folks didn't want us to, but sometimes we went there together. Somebody had started the rumor that that old swamp was haunted, and that meant ghosts. And while none of us boys believed in ghosts, we weren't exactly hoping to meet one without Big Jim along, who could have made short work of any ghost in a jiffy he was so strong. But poetry. You could never tell what he was going to do next. And as I told you, he'd already made up his mind he was going to be a detective when he grew up, and he wasn't afraid of anything. The three of us sat there looking pretty sober-faced, talking about what we'd better do, each of us trying on the disguise just to see how we looked with it on. Then all of a sudden it was five o'clock, and we knew we'd better be getting home quick or our folks would be worrying about us. That was one of Big Jim's rules. We weren't to cause our parents any worry if we could help it. Dragonfly made me take the fish, even though we had both caught it. Tomorrow we decided we'd get Big Jim and Circus and Little Jim, and the six of us would go down along the swamp and investigate that old hollow tree. We'd sneak up on the place and attack it from ambush. Of course, there wasn't anything to it, but you could never tell. That is the end of our chapter, actually three chapters, and I will see you again tomorrow evening. Have a good night.